And tonight we're going to talk about a topic that a person who was watching uh, suggested that we should talk about parenting styles. And I think it's very, very important from many angles, not only how we parent as adults, but how we were parented, which is even more important because it affects how we parent. And even bigger in importance, it, it affects how we think about ourselves, how we actually construct our self-image, our self-esteem, our self-confidence, our self-concept are all impacted by our parents, our parents who did a great job, our parents who did the best they could, our parents who didn't do a good job or were absent. All of these things affect us. So tonight I'm delighted that someone suggested this topic. So please sign in. Let me know that you're here. And while you're waiting for other people, if you haven't subscribed, please subscribe right just below the picture that you're watching so that you will get a notice anytime I have a new video. And it's important that um, you have that opportunity if you enjoy what I have to say. So parenting styles, really, really, really big. And think for a minute about your parents. I know you think you know already, but just think for a minute. What did my parents tell me about who I am? All the way along the way, did they tell me good things? Did they tell me balance between good and could be better? Did they ignore me? Did they have situations where maybe they were working a whole lot and they didn't have much time and how did that affect me? You know, I think I told a story a while back about my parents owned a grocery store and when I was about seven years old, it was a Sunday and my mother was sitting at her desk and she worked in the grocery store along with my father and I said, would you come out and play with me? And she looked at me with this look like, why do you exist? And she said, I'm too busy. And I said to her, and I remember saying this, I said, you're either too busy or too tired. Why did you have a child? Think of the message that I had been given for those seven years that I would even have the wherewithal to say that to my mother. That's the effect of parenting styles. And so it's really worth it. So I was thinking a lot about what I was going to talk about tonight. And I realized that I really believe that parenting is what you're being told about who you are. That's really what parenting is. What you're being told about who you are from even before you have been born. Because there's a lot of evidence to show that while you're still in the womb, you are receiving so much from the environment, the immediate environment of your mother, but outside sounds, happiness, unhappiness, tension, uh, loud noises, all kinds of things that you're taking in. And then you pop into this world and it's noisy and it's bright and who's there? And are they welcoming? Are they delighted to see you? Are they over the moon? Are there a whole lot of people there? Is there just one person there? What was it? How were you welcomed? I really hope you were welcomed with joy. That you were wanted and expected and expected as a wonderful addition to the family and that your welcome was huge and that you felt it because you would have felt it. But some of us don't have that experience. You know, some of us really maybe weren't expected. Uh, was People were kind of disappointed that we were on our way. Um, maybe they were afraid. Maybe they thought they couldn't feed us. Maybe they thought they couldn't manage with us. You know, any host of reasons, good reasons. Many often had good reasons. It all affected us. 
It's not good, bad, right, or wrong. It just affected us. So we're not here to find blame and and do all of that tonight, but to recognize the effect of parenting on who we become as adults, how we see ourselves, and how we parent, and how we are in relationship in the world. So these are really important things to think about. And again, as I said earlier, I'd love it if you'd say hello so that I know you're here. And um, do feel at any time quite welcome to ask your questions or share a story or um, com- comment on these concepts as I put them forward. So as I said, I really believe that parenting comes down to what you were being told about who you are from the time you arrived on the world. Now, I know about my situation. My father really wanted to have a child. My mother really didn't want to have a child. And that pretty much continued for my whole life. And I'm an only child. So that tells you something about how that went down after my birth. You know, it had an effect. Now, fortunately for me, I had two adoring godparents who had never had children together. They were older when I was born. And so I got all of that love where my mom and dad were a little bit at odds and not quite sure what was going on. And my mom wasn't, you know, all that thrilled (laughs) as far as I've been told. So it had an effect. Now, the good news is that once you understand the story of how you were parented and what its effect is, you are then free, much freer than ever, to choose how you want to be an adult. Because you can change your mind. You can change your feelings. You may need some help to do that, but you can do it. So what are the pieces of parenting? Let's think about that. Obviously, there's the verbal part of parenting, the things that you are you are hearing when you're a child, the things that they say to you, the things they say about you, the tone of their voice, uh, whether or not they make eye contact with you, the nonverbal cues, how they stand, how they look at you, you know, whether they lean into you and they're excited to be near you or whether they stand back and try to tell you things. All of these things are being picked up by the child's brain. Our brains grow until we're 30 years old. And the biggest growth spurt is up until the age of five or six. So think about your environment as we're going through this conversation tonight. What was your environment up until the age of six? What do you think they told you about you? How were you parented, in other words? So there's the verbal and then there's the nonverbal. Now, one of the things that you can watch when you're, you're looking at children is that Babies will watch. How do you stand? What's the look on your face? They will get it all down pat. And then you have this experience. The child is beginning to learn to walk or even just stand. And they're standing there and someone says, oh, look, they stand just like their dad or their mom because they've been watching. They've got this all down. They've been watching and watching and watching. And now they're doing it. Now that's just a body posture, imagine how much went in already about who they are, how they fit in the world, whether or not they're welcome, how to get their needs met, all of that. So we have the verbal and we have the nonverbal, and then we have what I call the inferential, meaning that they say things that are not direct. You know, they kind of look at you one way and say something different, and there's a mismatch. And you're not really sure which way to take it. So pretty often kids take it the wrong way uh, because of the brain growth. And so there's the inferential, um, how they speak about you to other people, right? We forget, you know, babies have ears and we're talking about them all the time. And they can't talk, but we're talking about them. They may not know words, but they know tone of voice. They know all kinds of things. We don't think about that enough. So if this is making sense to you and you want to talk or you want to share a story about how you were parented, by all means do so in the chat. 
and I, and I can see it, everybody can see it. Another thing that's important about parenting style is the referential, like how were you referred to? Some people have endearing pet names. Others are called names, a whole other way. How do they refer to you? Was it actually loving or was it separating? Or did they think they were being funny by saying something mean? You know, that's very important. How did they refer to you to, uh, when they were talking to their friends? You heard all this. You know all this. Communication, just like it is among adults, is direct or indirect. This is what your parenting style and how you were parented came across to you. So all of these pieces. And then... It's about what you do and what you don't do and how you do what you do and whether it's good enough or it's wonderful or it's not good enough and it's terrible and that you feel like when I'm this way, they really love me, but when I'm that way, they don't love me. Or when I'm being the way they want me to be, I don't feel good, but I get what I want. And when I'm being the way I want to be, I'm told I'm not good enough and all the things in between. So when we think about parenting style and we think about what parenting did I receive, it's really a worthwhile thing to do, to spend some time with a journal and some quiet moments thinking, okay, what did I learn about me at an early age? And who told me that? And do I like that person? Because it's, it's something we don't separate out when we're children. You know, it goes in and under our radar and we're trying to figure the world out and how to get people to like us and change our diaper or feed us or comfort us or do things. And <clears throat> we, we don't stop and think maybe 20 years later, I was told these things by this particular person about myself. And now as an adult, do I look at them and say, do I appreciate them? Do I like them? Do I approve of them? And if I, if I really do, then, you know, okay, they had things to say about me. Maybe I believe them. But if I don't approve or appreciate or even like that adult when I am an adult, Am I really going to allow myself to keep taking along the messages that they got, gave me when I was young? I hope not. But you see how all these things relate to parenting style. And it will become part of our parenting style until we kind of wake up and say, just a minute, let me look at what happened and what might I be doing that I could be doing differently and I'd be happier about it. Or maybe I'm doing a great job. I'm, I'm thrilled with the job that I'm doing. And I, I can just reinforce that for myself by looking at the things that I'm sharing with you tonight. So who are the models in your life? That's part of parenting style. You know, if you, if you as a parent tell children to do something and you do the opposite or something different, that's very confusing to children. Very confusing. And you're supposed to be helping them learn. So the modeling of how to be the person is so important. So you as a parent have to model your values. You know, demonstrate kindness. When you say, well, we're supposed to be kind, then you be kind. Or we're supposed to say nice things to other people, then you say nice things to your children. Or whatever the things that you're instructing your child to do, make sure that you're congruent with that. That you're in alignment, that that's what you do. Because the children will pick up on it. It's very, very confusing. Now, just a word, you know, because I talk so much about hijackles, those very difficult people. Those people that need power and control over us. So if you had a hijackal parent, the only way you're going to get attention from that hijackal parent is to be who and how they want you to be. And then they want you to praise and validate them. They want you to bring attention to them. So they want you to be particularly good so you make them look good. Now that's a big stress and strain on a child. 
a big, big, big one, right? That's asking way too much of a child to be the person who makes their parent look good. And yet think about how much of our parenting, when you really take it apart, comes down to exactly that. And so hijackles at home, and I know you've heard me say this before, hijackles at home create a private place of pain. And then out in the world, they often paint a picture of public perfection. So out there they look great and at home they're awful and you're supposed to go out there and have them look great and you're not supposed to talk about how awful it is at home. So that creates another whole kind of confusion. Like, who am I supposed to be? How am I supposed to be? You know, am I supposed to keep this one happy or that one happy? Or they're very different. I can't keep them both happy at the same time. This is all part of our parenting. Has a huge, huge, huge effect on the child. And because we can't figure that out when we're little, We don't have parietal lobe development enough or prefrontal lobe development enough to figure any of these things out. We are just responding to all this like, oh, how do I stay safe? How do I stay fed? How do I get moved from one place to the other? What do I need to do to keep those giants happy? You know, that's our stage of brain development. That's what's going on. And we're taking all this in about whether we're good enough or whether we are enough, or whether we actually should be there, or whether they're delighted that we're there and everything that we do is a joy. No, these are all messages that we have received. So what kind of messages did you receive? Just just put a little note in the chat. You know, did your parents say, you're wonderful? Were your parents delighted at your arrival? You know, let's just have a little chat about that. Were your parents conflicted like mine were? My mother was petrified to have a child. She claimed she was in labor for seven or for seven days. She didn't want to have a child. And I think she was petrified and didn't know what to do with one. My father, on the other hand, wanted a child because he had a lot of love to give. Now, unfortunately, he also had inappropriate behaviors, but he wanted a child. He really felt that that would be wonderful. What kind of situation were you born into? Where were you wanted? Did they both want you? Were there other family members delighted? Or were there some people who thought, maybe you shouldn't show up? All of that had an energetic effect on you as a child. Just like you as a parent are having an energetic effect at every moment on the people in your household, children and adults. It's a big responsibility because you are always emanating energy, positive, negative, happy, unhappy, judgmental, delighted, you know, name the emotion that's there, but you are always uh, emitting energy. You know, Maya Angelou said a wonderful thing. She said, and I'm paraphrasing, she said, the greatest gift you can give someone is to light up when they come into the room. Did your did your childhood include people lighting up when you came in the room? That they were just so excited that you were there? And that you were like, everybody's cooing over you? Everybody wants to play with you? Everybody wants to hold you? Did you have that experience? Do you know what kind of experience you had? Because that's important too. So all of these parenting things that are going on, deep, deep effect on who you became. Deep, deep effect on how you view relationship and how you feel about yourself in relationship. Okay, so Nicole says, my blood father left when I was two years old. I'm so sorry about that. Why am I particularly sorry? Because in the brain development and the emotional development of a child between 18 and 24 or 26 months is a time that is the most difficult to have the child experience separation from a parent. Now, for whatever reasons that happened in your life, but as you as an adult go back and look at it now, you can say, oh, 
okay, that, that had a particular effect on me at two years old. Because of my level of brain development and my general development, that was a critical time for me. Let me, th- let me sit with that. You know, I was working with a client today and we were going back through some experiences of childhood and saying, you know, what were these experiences like? And as we, dwe- as we dwelt on them for a little bit, it was like shining light in some dark corners. And the person went, oh, you know, I just had a flash. I, I remember feeling something. You know, we worked with that. So as I'm speaking to you, to you and with you tonight, allow yourself to think about that. You know, let your wall down. that You don't maybe want to think about this and let it down and say, you know, how did I really experience whether or not I was delighted people were delighted by my presence and how was my childhood alchemy said when my mother was mad she would roll her eyes at me yeah so would mine and it came with this (sighs) about yours i mean it was that output of breath that was like oh there you are again there you shouldn't be taking up space and drawing breath and Alchemy said they thought getting us a good education was enough. Well, I'm really glad to hear that they valued you getting a good education because at least that could set you up for a better life. But of course it wasn't enough because they educated you as to who you are and how to be in the world. And then they just sent you off to be educated every day by somebody else with whatever they had given you in your younger life. And so, yes, yay for a good education. But how about the real education, who you are as a human and how valued you are? So very important. So um, please feel free to put a few things here in the chat and let us know a little bit about your childhood. So the modeling was a really important thing. If your parents' models, models were congruent, what they said and what they did was the same, really great. You know, I I remember as a little child, I lived with my godparents because my mother uh, went away. And for a while, she wasn't well. And my godparents were older. And I was sort of their little doll. You know, my godmother made all my clothes. And I had matching underwear and matching socks and matching purses and matching hats and all that stuff. So I was, I was their little doll. And then they had a little uh, grandchild coming that um, he was a little bit of trouble. And what my godmother has said to me now, and this is me at three years old, you know, my godmother would say, now you have, to be a, you have to be a sample for David. You have to be a sample. And I guess I got tired of it because my godmother used to tell the story that one day I just looked at her and I stamped my foot three years old and I said I'm tired of being a sample (laughs) but that was the modeling I was supposed to model how to be a perfect child at three years old to this two and a half year old hellion right so what was the modeling that you got from your parents how did they demonstrate congruence with what they said and did or did they tell you to do something and then went off and did whatever they wanted that makes a huge difference so the modeling is a big thing how were values demonstrated in your family you know did you know what your family stood for or stood up for do you know what your family liked or didn't like did you know that if love was a big part of being part of a family Many of us don't go back and look at our own values as adults, and it's a very important exercise. You know, in my book, Kaizen for Couples, I talk about it. I have an exercise in there called the value shuffle. So important for us each to know so that we can have conversations about it in our relationships. But first, as individuals, we need to know it. So what values were demonstrated and were they congruent? You know, I remember one day um, as an adult, I took my three kids and went to visit my parents and they wanted us to go to church with them. So we went to church and then after we got out of church, we got into my father's and mother's car into the back seat and they got to the first stop sign. We, we were still in view of the church and a 
a person who was very drunk walked in front uh, crossing the road. And my mother let out a whole lot of words I didn't want my kids to hear. Racist, ugly, oh, horrible. We we're at a stop sign, right? So I opened the doors and got myself and my children out of there. And my parents were so annoyed because the people at the church standing around could see this. I couldn't have it that we just heard these things in church and then my mother immediately was doing the opposite. I would not have that for my children. Have you had experiences like that? Where your parents said, do this, and then they did the opposite or something completely other? That's how they parented you. What effect did it have on you? What affect did it have on you? How did you feel about it? What effect did it have? How did you change? What did it do that, what did it set in motion for you? I mean, these are very important things. Did you have congruent parents? Parents who did what they said, just put a yes or no in the chat. Did they actually live the values that they told you that you should live up to? Or was that clear or unclear to you? So these are very important pieces, right? Are they ringing any chords for you? Are they striking any chords, ringing any bells? Um, is it waking you up to some thoughts about how you were parented and maybe how you parent now? Nicole says, I don't feel we talked about values at all. Yeah, maybe you didn't talk about them. Did you feel, Nicole, that they were, they were sort of expressed in your, in your family? That everybody in your family felt that they, that they understood, like we stand for being loving and accepting or we stand for being judgmental and critical. You know, what, how, did they, how did that message get across to you? Bama girl says, my mother, no, my father, yes. Okay, so that's a conflict right there, right? Uh, who do I believe and how do I know and which one am I with and how am I supposed to respond when I'm with that one? Very confusing for a child. Did you find it confusing, Bama girl? Did you know how to keep your ducks in a row with who, which parent and what to do when they were both together and they were different? Think of the effect of that on a child. Like, which one do I please? Or do I just withdraw and hope that they don't see me and I become invisible? Right? Children do that. You know, they you ask them a question they don't even want to answer. They just kind of pull back and kind of look down like, I don't want to catch your eyes. I don't want to figure it out. I don't know what to do because I have to keep those giants happy so they'll feed me and take care of me and I don't know what the right answer is so I'm just going to look down. And then maybe that became a posture in life that you you don't face life right on, that you don't look people in the eyes, you, you, you're not, you don't think you're good enough. And that's how we get our messages and that's what parenting is all about. It's a big deal. A really big deal. So here's a big part of parenting. And I, I really invite you to think about it. Were you validated for who you were, what you thought, what you felt, what you needed, and what you wanted? Because it is the parent's job to validate the child. And what I mean by validation is that you honestly got the feeling deep inside you that you deserve to take up space and draw breath, that you were welcome in this world. And how people validate children is by being interested in them. Not telling a child, you're crying. If you want something to cry about, I'll give it to you. Like, I will be the author of your tears. You don't have the right to have feelings because that's inconvenient to me. Uh, if you're going to cry, I'll give you something to cry about. That's quite clear, right? I will be the one in charge of whether you have a feeling. So your feelings didn't get validated. In instead, you would lean in and say, oh, you're crying. Are you, what's, what's happened? Tell me about it. Oh, that sounds hard. Did that make you really, really unhappy? And then you're validating the child. You're seeing the child. 
But if you had a parent who didn't know what to do with your feelings, maybe it wasn't good with children, maybe it wasn't good with their own feelings, they, they would be the ones who would say, be quiet, you know, I'll give you something to cry about. How was that for you? Nicole says, my mother is very critical to this day. I do remember conversations in which they talked about how physical love and emotional love didn't need to go together. Okay, that's a philosophy that they had, that, you know, maybe you could love somebody, but you didn't have physical intimacy. Maybe it was fine to have physical intimacy with people you didn't care about. I mean, the whole spectrum of values is out there, but critical. I mean, that's a big statement, Nicole. My mother is very critical to this day. Well, a critical mother is an unhappy mother right? She's not happy with who she is, so she makes sure that she is always outwardly focused criticizing other humans. And many times when we have a critical parent, that critical parent is trying to play defense and offense at the same time, right? Like, there's nothing wrong with me, and there's something wrong with everybody else, and I will be the first to talk about that so nobody will talk about me. You know, that kind of thing happens. So, Nicole, while I'm answering Obama girl, um, was is that true at all when you think about your mom? And Obama girl said, my mother said the thing about crying to me all the time. I'm so sorry. That's so unfair. I just recently realized it was okay to cry and now realized I'm way more sensitive than I thought I was. You know, you bring up a really important point. Because sometimes parents don't know what to do with sensitive children. So they try and toughen them up. And that is such a disservice. Such a disservice. So I'm glad that you're reflective enough to come into the fact that you are allowed to cry. Crying is a way for us to get rid of some very, very deep feelings. Or to allow ourselves to feel something deeply. Do you know... Oh, and, you know, I think I think everybody on the call who's ever been on one of the calls realized that I came from a very difficult background. So when I watch television and I see families doing loving things, or I watch American Idol and somebody is such a great relationship with their parent, I cry, right? Like, it touches me deeply, but I know where it came from. It came from all that, no, there'll be no crying, Right. So therefore, you're not allowed to have that. So I'm so glad, Bama Girl, that you know it's okay to cry because it's very okay to cry. And, And it's a healthy response to many situations. And sometimes it's a great relief and cathartic to do it. Now, of course, if any of us come to crying all the time, we may be so depressed that we need some help. But crying is natural. It's the first thing most of us do when we're born. <laughs> like, I don't like this. We cry. You know, it's cold out here and it's bright lights and there's, you know, I'm not in nice warm water anymore. <laughs> I don't like it. So I cry. So why shouldn't we able be able to continue to understand that crying is one of the ways that we express our emotions? Okay, Nicole, great. That could be very possible. Yeah. So... Yes, to have some compassion for your mother, to be able to realize that maybe she couldn't deal with all that. It doesn't condone her or enable her behavior to be very critical. You know, I know why my mom was so critical and so nasty and all. I didn't like it and I didn't, I didn't let my children be around it and I didn't place myself around it. But I understood it. And that was helpful. So if that could be very possible, it might be helpful because that criticism has nothing to do with you. When you really realize you have a critical mom, she's always critical, critical of you, maybe critical of other people, critical of the world, critical of everything. It has nothing to do with you. It's about who she is and how she's experiencing life and what she's afraid of. And she probably doesn't express well. So therefore... You know, if you only have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And so she's critical all the time. Mine certainly was. And it was just a defense because she couldn't bear the idea of being criticized. 
So, of course, my mom was a hijackal, so you can't criticize a hijackal. That's like poking a bear. So if you criticize a hijackal, they're going to turn it on you in an instant. And maybe your mom did a little of that too. So have a look at that. So this validation business is very, 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 very important. You need to validate yourself. That you have the right to have your feelings. You have the right to have your thoughts. You have the right to have your needs and your wants. Very important. You know, when I mentioned my book, Kaizen for Couples, I just want to show that to you. It's on Amazon. You can download it in, uh, if you like, or you can buy the print book. But everything that is important to me about any kind of relationship, couples or not, I put in this book. And I highly recommend that you read it because it will help you see yourself and how you developed the uh, ways uh, that you have of viewing yourself and yourself in relationships and your views of other people. Now, I want to talk about two really big, sad things that may have happened to people so that you just have this in your mind when you're understanding other people or you're understanding yourself. And that is the idea of childhood emotional neglect. You know, if somebody didn't know what to do with the child or didn't want the child or was put out by the child or simply was so self-preoccupied, whether that was just simply because they were a fearful person or they were um, very ego-driven or perhaps they had substance or alcohol abuse issues, you might suffer from childhood emotional neglect. Nothing that you did, but they were just not present for you. They did not interact with you. They did not validate you. Anybody have that happen? That you were just there and preferably not too visible and have no wants at all. And then maybe they'd tolerate you. So remember, I'm talking about a small section of the world, but I want to bring it up tonight. We're talking about parenting. Because to have a child in the best of all worlds, we want that child. And we welcome that child and we make that child feel welcomed for their whole life. And that doesn't mean that we're always in love with the child. Sometimes we don't like them very much. But the child always knows that basically they're loved and they're welcome. And that they're accepted and appreciated and acknowledged and seen and heard and known. And that's validation. And if we didn't get that when we were children, we need to make sure that we get some help to get it within ourselves to know how to validate ourselves and make sure that you're in relationships that are at least neutral, preferably validating. And the person that you have an emotionally rich relationship with or that you long to have an emotionally intimate and rich relationship with, make sure that they're a validating human being. That you're not running after them, looking for them to validate you. You, you, you turn yourself into a pretzel hoping that they'll like you, that's because you didn't get enough validation when you were small. And that's not a healthy way to be. So if you find yourself, you know, maybe doing a little people pleasing or hoping that people will like you and turning yourself into a chameleon or a pretzel, as I said, to try and think, how do you like me so far? How do you like me now? <laughs> if, if that's kind of the dance that you're doing, you want to get some help. I'm always here to help you. You know, um, you can have your initial consultation for one full hour for only $97. So go to fourrelationshiphelp.com slash join if that's something that you'd like to have. And we can talk about it. So I told you I'd talk about two really disturbing things. One of them is childhood emotional neglect. And that's C-E-N is what we call it, SENS. And the other is adverse childhood experiences, ACEs, adverse childhood experiences. So things happened when we were small. Remember, our brains aren't fully developed. And so we, we perceive things and we've, we decided how things were. And when we're little, we think we created everything and we caused everything. Not that we think like we're, we're all ego and, and driving all the buses. It's just like we think, okay, I got them to feed me. I got them to change my clothes my diaper, you know, like I'm, I'm making all this happen. But as we get older, we start thinking that, you know, we made that person cry or that's unhappy, that person's unhappy. And maybe we did something. 
and and we take on a whole lot before we have parietal and prefrontal lobe development. And so these things really are important for us to think about. Really, really important. So if you experience childhood emotional neglect or had adverse childhood experiences, do get some help because it would be really good to bring those up and clear and clean them and choose differently moving forward. It would be much healthier for you and for your children and for your relationships and for your life. So important. So I've given you lots of ideas here. What are you thinking about? Do you have any questions for me? Put them in the chat as I finish this up. So what did you take in from being parented? What was the final result? Are you confident? Are you feeling um, that you can take your place in the world, that you don't have to be better or less than any other human? You're comfortably comfortable in the world. Or are you comfortably uncomfortable in the world because you're a little bit hypervigilant? Am I doing okay? Um, is there something I can get you? If I do more for you, will you like me better? You know, all of those pieces. Because they came from when you were a child in most cases. And how did you get it? Parenting, right? Now let's just talk about the, the difference between strict parenting and permissive parenting. Okay, both of these things can be done with love. What we think about though is that strict parenting maybe doesn't have as much love in it. Permissive parenting doesn't have as much love in it because nobody's paying attention to you. <laughs> So it's not about love or not love. It's about there's one way to do it. I had a person that I, I used to have in some of my groups come up to me on the street the other day and she's she has a problem not taking her medication sometimes. And she was just wild-eyed and she said to me, there's only one truth and I know it. And I thought, oh dear. <laughs> Oh dear, she has decided that she is the arbiter and the only purveyor of truth in the world. Very, very difficult place to be because everybody has a sense of their own truth and they have a sense of generalized truth and sometimes those things are not um, matching. But she, she ended up you know, telling me, you know, no, 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 I know, I know, and it's all true. And I thought, oh dear. You know, but that's a good example of one form of parenting. I am always right. I am always right. And I will always be right. And you will always be wrong. So you do it my way. You live up to my expectations. You know, when my partner and I wrote the book, Soul Solitude, Taking Time for Our Souls to Catch Up, we talked about one of the big predicaments of life is that when you can release the idea that you're here to live up to the expectations of others as an adult, you become free to be you. So of course we live by the expectations of others when we're children. But did you blossom into living by your own expectations? And did you examine them? No matter what your parents gave you, did you examine and decide who you want to be from that moment forward? Or are you kind of on autopilot? what you got when you were parented kind of is remaining, even though you don't feel good about it. And that's the whole joy of, of working with someone, a professional, you know, because they can ask you questions that will cause you to think about your life and, and how you most want to be in life and how you want your relationships to work. So Nicole says, what should we do? We see a family member treating their children rather unfriendly without accidentally taking on too much responsibility. Oh, such a delicate balance, isn't it? Huh. Well, <laughs> I'm going to bring out this book again because in here I give the most important thing that I, maybe one of the most important things that I've developed and it's a way of communicating exactly for this situation and every other tricky situation, but also every other situation that you want to be healthy. And I talk about the personal weather report. So how this, how this refers to what you're asking, Nicole, when you say, what should we do if we see a family mem member treating their children in an unfriendly manner without taking on too much responsibility for it? is the ability to give a personal weather report. You can read all about it in chapters five and six, but 
here's what it would sound like. Wow, you know, I think when I was little that I really wanted to feel like the adults liked me. It's really important to children, I think. What do you think? So all I've done is talk about myself. I haven't commented on their parenting. I haven't said anything about a specific situation. But I've opened it up by talking about myself. And I've opened up a place to have a conversation. If parents are not only unfriendly, but they're cruel or mean or degrading or they hurt their children or whatever, that's a whole other matter. But if you just don't like the way that they kind of are with their children, then talk about your response to life and remembering when you were a child and what really made you feel good and put those things into the conversation. Because unless they're very close and they're very interested in what you think, feel, need, and want, they're not going to be open to a conversation about how they parent, are they? So it's a tricky one. I hope that helps, Nicole. If it doesn't, ask another question. Bama Girl said, that was my mom. She would take it to the extreme and tell me I was lying to her when what I was saying didn't match with what she thought I had done. So I would have to lie to avoid worse punishment. Oh, you're so not alone on that one. You know, mother makes up her mind what really happened regardless of what happened or didn't happen. And until you say what she wants to believe, you're just being threatened with getting worse punishment. I understand that completely. And that's a very sad way to parent. A very sad way because that's a hijackal way. That's an allaboutme.com way. I will tell you what you think. I will tell you how things happened. I will tell you what you saw. I will tell you how you should be. In one of the Facebook groups that I have the other day, and you're welcome to join in there, but it's much more powerful if you join in at optimizedcircles.com. Somebody asked a question and they said, what does it mean to gaslight a child? Now, you know, gaslighting is when an adult tries to tell you what you think and what you feel and what you need and what you want without any regard for asking you. They just want to tell you. They want to be the expert and they want to define your reality for them. So my response when they said, what does it mean to gaslight a child? I says the same thing. You tell a child what they want. You tell a child what they need. You tell a child who they are. You tell a child what they think and what they feel. You give them, these are the only acceptable options. You better choose among them to make me happy. That's gaslighting children. They don't get to have their own reality. They don't get to say that they're hurting. They don't get to say they're unhappy. They don't get to say, I don't like that. They're told that they should or they must or they have to. And of course you do because your brother did or all the people in our family did. And many of you will have heard that, right? And that's gaslighting. And that's just really sad. And it's also very destructive parenting. So I'm sorry that that happened to you. But at least you understand completely, like you've shown in a couple of your comments here, that you are not the person that she parented. You have the opportunity of going, whoop, didn't like that much. Don't believe it either. I'm going to choose differently now as an adult. And that's the wonderful freedom of being an adult. You can take out your childhood and look at it and say, like this part, don't like this part so much, going to get rid of that part and replace it with something that makes me happier. And yeah, it's not that simple. Sometimes, you know, many times people have come to me and say, I don't know what's wrong. And we'll work it out and then we'll fix it. And then they'll go away and they'll be much happier and their relationships will be much happier. It's hard to do alone. And it's not so good to just go to a friend because they, they want to be your friend. <laughs> so you need to go where, where there's a neutral person with your best interests at heart and have that help you. Okay, so these are all important things. What did you take in from your parenting? Examine it now and see what you want to keep and what you'd like to replace. And, and set those things aside and ask yourself, if you have a negative message that's been given to you by a parent, ask yourself, what evidence do I have in reality that that is true? And almost every single time you'll come up with none, none at all. It's an old paradigm and I'm not buying it anymore. 
and that's very very helpful so it's very much worth revisiting messages that you may have taken in from your parents and you know we've got 10 minutes left here if there are questions get them up there so I can be sure to answer them any comments that you might have has this been helpful did it open any thoughts any feelings did it help you see something is there something I can help with in the next 10 minutes put it there and I want to also say that coming along to these live streams I'm so glad that you do because we do have this opportunity to talk about different topics all the time and if there's a topic that you would like me to talk about put it in the chat now and just put topic and then put whatever it is because you may have something on your mind that you'd like me to talk about for a bit and I'd be happy to do that and then have a conversation among everybody here on the live stream and if you're listening to the live stream and uh, it's it's finished you can always go to my page uh, on forrelationshiphelp.com on the podcast page or the, sh the live stream page and you can put your comments there or you can comment right here on YouTube and say I'd like to hear more about this or that and uh, I'm happy to do that right and that's that's what I want to do because if there's a way that I can help you I want to do that so any further comments any further questions well I'm so glad that you're here with me and I hope you'll bring your friends along if you think that might be helpful to them because it's a gift you can give them I surely invite you to listen to my podcasts there are two of them one is called emotional savvy the relationship help show and the other is called save your sanity help for toxic relationships so wherever you like to get your podcasts or they're right here on YouTube I post them on YouTube after the show every week subscribe to those download them from where you like to get podcasts so that when you go walking and all you've got them right there to listen to and come on over to optimizedcircles.com completely off any social media a membership five dollars for your first month at any level get into the discussion threads have those safe conversations completely off social media you can ask the deep questions I'm in there all the time I answer them at the bottom level you get my 21 steps to empowered emotional savvy home study program plus access to the discussion groups and over 150 frequently asked questions at the second level you get all that plus webinars recorded webinars and one live webinar a month at the third level you get all that plus two group ask me anything calls a month you can actually come on the zoom call and ask me your questions so go to optimizedcircles.com and become part of that a safe great place to talk about what's really happening and ask your questions so I'm glad you were with me and until I see you again hopefully next week visit me at 4 for relationship help help dot com take good care and create a wonderful week bye bye